We have uh, a world at the moment that's uh, very stressful, uh, worrying and concerning. And uh, uh, we have a topic tonight, which is one of those big questions that we ask, is there hope of life in heaven after death? So the question is then, uh, is there hope of life in heaven after death? Um, the, the reality of death, ladies and gentlemen, is something that um, causes us to reflect very much on our own sense of, of helplessness. Uh, we can't reverse what has actually happened with death. It's one of those things that comes about. There's no respecter of persons. We can be young, we can be old, we can be healthy, uh, and the illness or a, or a car accident of some form strikes us down and, and we're left with, uh, with, with nothing at all, aren't we? We've lost a, lost a family member, we've lost a partner, we've lost a child, or we've lost a relative in some form. All human resources, ladies and gentlemen, are powerless to restore a dead person back to life. And it leaves us with this intense feeling of, of grief and anxiety and, and of sadness. Uh, and uh, the reality of death is something that we face uh, every day. Uh, and as I said before, Brother Dan uh, alluded to that in his prayer, uh, our world is a time of worry at the moment. And these big questions are being asked. Uh, being asked every day when we read of a of death count of, uh, of a country, of Australia uh, and of the world. And in fact, um, Melbourne's gone back into to stage four lockdown, uh, trying to, to, to look after the state and indeed the whole of, whole of Australia. Um, it's interesting that we react to death, don't we, at, at different stages of, of our life, but particularly as we get older. Uh, young people in the audience tonight, um, and even those of middle age, it's not something we, we, we think about. We, uh, we've got lots to look forward to as such, and, and death is not something that is a, is a concept that we, that we really engage much time in. And as we grow a little older and a little more frailer, the reality of our own bodily uh, inadequacies, of the failure of our, of our strength, uh, begin to, to catch up, and we, and we start to reflect on that, and we start to think about about what it is, what it is that life is offering for us. We start to look back sometimes with some regret uh, and look back at the things that have, have passed. Uh, it's only in the latter stages of life that we really reflect on this. And death makes us ask those big questions, those big questions that we talked about at the very start. Did we come into the world, this beautiful world, just simply to fret over a few short years and then to die uh, and then to remain in the grave forever? Our death and decay, all that we've got, look, look, got to look forward to. Is that what it's all about? And these are the big questions that we, we start to think about and start to worry about as we get a little older in, in age. The prospect of doing something new and exciting is, is, is not there as much. It begins to diminish. Uh, if we would look at, uh, at you know, our local church and have a chat to a pastor of some form and, and, and see what he might have to say, uh, he would tell us that uh, when a man's body dies, his, his body corrupts, he physically corrupts, but there is within him a, a, a divine soul that, that flies off up to heaven and spends time in, in immortal glory. And, uh, and after death, this, this soul is, is with God, enjoying, enjoying the pleasures forevermore. In fact, we can, go to a, we can go to a funeral from a person who doesn't even believe God, has not spent any time at all thinking about God. And yet the, uh, the person presiding over that funeral will, will send them to heaven as if it's a place that they're going to go to for, for no apparent reason. Uh, very rarely we do hear about the, the, the exact opposite of that belief, that if they've been wicked, then they're going to spend the rest of their life, the eternity, in, in, a, in a place of destruction or uh, a place of burning fire known as hell. So this is the, the popular theology. And the big question tonight is, is this right? Is this something that, that, that we can actually expect? Immortality, though, ladies and gentlemen, is, is something that uh, is simply a pagan teaching. It's nothing that even emerged from the Bible whatsoever. The word, uh, or the words together, immortal soul, don't even appear in the Bible. You can't find it. You can search your way. You might find the word immortal. You might find the word soul. But you'll never find them together. And, uh, of course... If they can't find those two words together, never a concept about an immortal soul going off to heaven. In fact, the concept's not even taught by the apostles in the New Testament. It's actually borrowed from, from Greek, from, from Egyptian, from Syrophoenician, from Babylonian mythology. It's pagan teaching. 
And as I've got there on the screen, it's actually a spiritual drug that was invented to, to, to deaden or to mask the sorrow of, of death when uh, you lost a loved one. It was there to mask that pain. It makes sense, doesn't it? To know that the loved one that, that, that's passed, that's left you, either through, a, through an illness or a, or a war or a, or a famine or just, just old age, this loved one that you've, you've cared for and, and been with all your life, companionship, has now gone and is laying before you in a, in, a, in a stark grave. No, the concept of being able to know that that person is living on in an afterlife. It's a wonderful thing to think about. And so this, this concept came about, a, a spiritual drug to deaden the pain. But what it does, ladies and gentlemen, and what we're going to find tonight, is it actually turns people away from understanding the proper message of the Bible. And that's what we want to get across tonight. This concept of going to heaven when you die has, has stopped people properly understanding what the Bible wants for you and I. What the Bible, or what God himself, who wrote the Bible, the author of the Bible, wants for you and for I. And just a little note on the screen there. If it were true, if it were true that people could go off to this, this wonderful place in heaven, to be with God as, you know, playing harps up in the, in the clouds or whatever the notion is, then why are we keeping people in hospital beds, keeping them alive on, on life support? Why do people cling to life so much when there's every opportunity to turn that machine off and go off and be in, in, in pain-free immortality with God? Why is it? It seems cruel, doesn't it, that we would keep them clinging on to a life that seems so unpleasant at the moment? So we've, we've got the big questions which we've talked about, but we really want to settle these questions, don't we? we? We want to see what actually happens after death. And where do we go for that, for that answer? Where do we go for this thoroughly truthful answer about what happens to us after death? Well, there's no other place where the concept comes from than, than the Bible. There's no other place that we, that we can actually turn to than the, the, the word, of, word of God. The Bible actually is described as, as, as the message of God, a message which he has delivered to, to all of, of mankind. It talks about him, it talks about his purpose with the earth, uh, it talks about what he expects from you and from I. We, we can understand that the word of God is his message to us, and I've got a couple of uh, um, quotations on the, on the screen there. Second of Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 to 17, and also second of Peter chapter 1. Let's turn those up. Um, second of, of Timothy chapter 3, it's a very well-known quotation. The Apostle Paul writes some words to um, a young man that, uh, that was uh, seeking to follow after him. It was some of the very last words which he actually wrote in the Bible, um, and uh, which really are important words for us to have a look at and, and remind us about why we can turn to the Bible, why we can have confidence that the Bible is, is so true. Let's read 2 Timothy chapter 3 then, and reading from verse 14, um, the Apostle Paul is talking to Timmy, Timothy and he says, Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that, Timothy, from a child, you've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. He says, Timothy, all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Key quotation in the Bible. In fact, other translators actually say that that word uh, inspiration is, is God breathed. All right, so God spoke the words and the words are relevant for us. Why? Well, they are able to make us wise to salvation. We can understand what salvation is. It says there it's profitable just for human mankind just to, to receive doctrine, correction, instruction, important words. Well, so if God breathed out these words, how did they get onto the page? How did they get recorded? And our second quotation gives us that information. Second of Peter, chapter 1. Just come over there for a moment. Second of Peter, chapter 1 and verse 21. Or reading from verse 19. The Apostle Peter writes, uh, 2 Peter 1 and verse 19, he says, We've got a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shines in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. 
Peter says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is any private interpretation. No one's just sat down and thought, you know what, uh, Trevor Dodson, I'm going I'm to write something in a, in a book and I'm going to get that recorded in here. Didn't happen. No one of any private interpretation sat down and just decided to write a book. He said, no, and keep in mind our word from 2nd of Timothy, that it's God breathed. He says, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, not just starting there to write a book. He says, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And what we're being told there is God breathed out these words to specific individuals who then sat down and wrote these words out. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is absolutely critical for us because it gives us the confidence to know that every single book, every single page of this Bible is the word of God. It's his words. He appointed men to write it. And yes, they sat down and they penned out those words. But it's God breathed. The whole lot is inspired. So when we go to the Bible to talk about this concept of, of, of heaven or, or hell or, or an afterlife or eternal life, we're confident, aren't we, that we're reading a message from God himself. And he encourages us to get it right, to read the message and understand it. And we can have confidence when we go to the Bible that we're actually listening to the words of God himself. Where do we start, though, to get a bit of a concept or an idea? All the way back at the beginning. That makes sense, doesn't it? Go to the very beginning of the book to get a bit of a picture about what's going on. So let's go there. Back in the, the very start of our book, Genesis chapter 2. All the way back in the book of Genesis, we're told that man was created on the, on the sixth day. Uh, Genesis chapter 1 gives us the breakdown of the days of creation. And then in chapter 2, it almost like pauses and says, all right, let's go back and have a look at that sixth day. And let's see what happened. And let's unpack that a little further. Okay? So it says there in verse 7, when man was made on the sixth day, this is what happened. So verse 7 of chapter 2 says... The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. And what we've been told there is that really Adam, the very first man, was created by God, dependent on his creator for life. And he was formed, however sure, we're not, we're not really quite aware of how it was all done, pulled together. Uh, from, from, from dust into clay, made into some form of shape, and then, of course, breathed into him the, the, the breath of life. And he became a living soul. It's quite interesting to note in Genesis chapter 6, verse 17, and Genesis chapter 7 and verse 22, that animals also were created in the same sort of way. Formed, fashioned, breathed into them the breath of life, and they became, if you like, living creatures, a living soul. All right? Definitely doesn't say there, and man became an immortal soul. It just says a living soul. In fact, if we go to the Hebrew words, uh, and in fact, other translators of the Bible have picked up this concept, that the words living soul just simply mean a living creature. A living creature, a breathing frame. So a couple of, quote, a couple of versions of the Bible, the Revised Standard Version, the New International Version, the, um, the New uh, English Bible, all these Different versions of the Bible simply take out those words living soul and replace them with living creature. So this is the concept that we're talking about. We're not talking about an immortal soul. We're not talking about having some sort of divine spirit that lives on in an afterlife. You become a breathing creature, a breathing frame. Over in, in the Garden of Eden where Adam was established, God put a couple of trees in there, a tree of the knowledge of good and evil and a tree of life. And he put a command against the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that you will not eat. It was a test for man to see whether he would actually follow God's commandments or not. It's a simple story that we probably all know well. Uh, Adam and Eve both failed and, and ate of the tree and disobeyed. And God punished them both. But their punishment was particularly pronounced in, in verse 19. Of Genesis chapter 3 where he says in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground for out of it wast thou taken for dust thou art and unto dust shalt thou return and so what we're being told there is that the command given to Adam and Eve if they disobeyed it would result in death it didn't result in an immediate cut off and cessation of life 
What we're being told there is that it began a process of dying, of mortality. Out of it was thou taken, the dust, out of that was thou taken, and unto dust will you return again. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the destiny of all mankind. Death, as it says on the screen there, is not a door opening to a new life. It's the judgment for disobedience. From dust you were taken and formed, as we saw in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. And when you die, back to dust you will go again. So Genesis reveals not only man's creation, man's destiny, but man's fate as well. Over in chapter 6, and remember we've gone back to the book of Genesis to just get those foundations that really are, are continued on right through the Bible. Genesis chapter 6 gives us an example of what happens at death. And if you like, it's the first record of, of mass death on a, on a large scale. And in Genesis chapter 6, we, we know the story well. It's, a, it's the story of Noah and the flood. Uh, and the whole earth was covered in a flood. Why did that actually happen? Well, chapter 6 and verse 11 to 12 really sum it up for us. Uh, and it says it a couple of times back in verse 5 as well. And God saw that the, the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And the very imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Down in verse 11, the earth was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God looked upon his creation, saw that people weren't heading in a direction that he wanted. And he, he chose to destroy his creation and leave behind Adam, sorry, not Adam, uh, Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives and a selection of animals, put them in the ark and, 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 and kept them. But what happened to everybody else? What happened to the, 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 the millions of humans that were on, on earth at that time? What happened to all the animals that were there? Well, they passed away. Genesis chapter 7, just go over the page where it talks about what actually happened. Verse 21 says, And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of the fowl of the cattle and of the beast and every creeping, so every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life of all that was in the dry land died. Every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground, both of man, of cattle and creeping thing, the fowls of heaven, they were destroyed from the earth and Noah only remained alive and they that were with him in the ark. What I want you to notice there, ladies and gentlemen, is that the outcome of this destruction was that man and beast all died. The breath of life was removed from them and they died. What we're being told here is that really man and beast and their end is the same. We end up dying, passing away. It doesn't mean that we go off somewhere else. We die. The breath of life is removed and we pass away. As it says there on the screen, man and animals, we share a common fate. A couple of other quotations. And, and by the way, I, there's a lot of quotations on the screen and there will be. It's a message right through the Bible and we want to show that tonight. Make no excuse for putting up a number of quotations on the screen. Psalm 104 speaks about the, uh, the, the outcome for, for both man and animal. It says that thou God takes away their breath. They die and they return to the dust. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, which we read tonight, our reading for tonight, speaking to man. He says that they themselves are, are beasts. For that which befalleth the sons of men befalls beasts. Even one thing befall them, as the one dieth, so dieth the other. Yea, they all have one breath, all go into one place, all are of the dust, and all turn to dust again. Got a consistent message, haven't we? Message is really, really clear. There's no afterlife, we're not heading off into heaven to, to waft up into some clouds, we're not going off into hell to, to burn below in eternal torment. We simply go back to the grave and pass away and corrupt and die, just like an animal. No difference whatsoever. Does it mean that, that, that man is, is no better than the animals? Is, is there any difference? 
Well, interestingly, in the book of Genesis, chapter 1 and verse 26, when it was talking about the creation of man, it said that the angels created man, really key words, in the image and the likeness of God. In the image and likeness of God. In other words, man was physically in the appearance of God. But not only that, in the likeness. And that word likeness is really interesting in, in, the, in the original Hebrew. It actually means mental capacity. It means that we actually have a capacity that is beyond the animals. A capacity to think and to understand and respond to God. That makes us different. We can see that, can't we? Just with, with, a, with a, you know, your own pet, with a dog or a cat. They don't get the concepts of, of morality. They don't get this, this, this idea of, of behaving, of, of doing something right or wrong. Yes, they might, you know, they might destroy a, a teddy bear or, a, or, or, or pull out some paper and screw it up or something like that. But they don't get this concept of, of right and wrong, of morality. They've got no idea. That concept alone is with man. It's a concept that man has been given because he is in the likeness, has the same mental capability as God. We alone have that, and we're able to think like that. Psalm 49 says that man is in honour, sorry, sorry, man that is in honour, and understandeth not, is just like the beasts that perish. That's a really interesting quotation, Psalm 49 verse 20. Man that is in honour and understands not, is like the beasts that perish. What that's saying, ladies and gentlemen, is that, if we are just like acting like the beasts and don't use this mental capacity, don't actually try and find out what God wants by understanding, as the verse says, our fate's the same as the beasts. All right. Now, I've already said, haven't I, that man and beast, we just go and corrupt and, and, and die. But there's a very interesting little point, and we're going to just discuss this a little later. And, and that's the point, that understanding, understanding something, in fact, understanding exactly what God wants for us and doing something about it, can be the difference between the fate of man and animal. And while we all go into the ground and corrupt and die in the grave, there can be a hope for each one of us if we understand and use this God-given likeness, this mental capability of God. And we'll see that in a moment. So the questions we have then is, is, does the soul live on? I think you know the answer to that already. But let's just have a think about that. As I said at the start of our lecture, not once in the hundreds of references in the Bible is the soul ever said to be, to be immortal or continuing in, a, in an afterlife after we die. Not once is there, a, is there a reference to show. A couple of quotations there that give us some little confidence in that. But Psalm 78 he, that is God, spared not their soul from death and gave their life over to pestilence. Talking about the children of Israel, actually. And he brings those two words together, soul and life, to show that it's essentially the same. He spared not their life from death and gave their soul to the pestilence, if you like. Almost using those words interchangeably. But what he's essentially saying is their outcome was the same. Also in Ezekiel chapter 18, he says, the soul that sins, it shall die. What a soul, it, it, like, a, like an immortal thing inside us going to, going to heaven. If, if that sins, we shall die. The quotation's really, really clear. The person, the individual, you, me, anyone outside, if we sin, the outcome is death. And we can see that all the way back in the book of Genesis with Adam, the very first person who disobeyed God. And the outcome was Dust thou art, unto dust will you become. So the soul then, on the screen it says, the soul then is the person, the living being. When it perishes, the soul or the life perishes with him. That's our outcome. That's what we can expect. Just simply going into the grave. What about this notion of hell? The Bible talks about hell a, a number of times and uses the word hell. And in fact... We could say, well, you know, is this word in the Bible, is God actually condemning humans to this eternal torment? In fact, funnily enough, the, the, the concept of hell is starting to, to drift away from church teaching. It just doesn't fit with the, 
the humanistic model of, of, a, of a loving God. How could God, this loving God, send people like you and me down to this place of torment and torment us with pitchforks and, and, and lava and, and hot stuff and you know, put us in eternal pain? Why would God do that? Doesn't fit the model. And so we're starting to see people shift away. In fact, I had a conversation with someone at a, at a previous workplace who said to me that they don't believe in hell, hell anymore. They just think it's a place further away from God. And I said to them, Where, where's that idea from? Where'd you get that idea? I, I, I don't know. I, it's just how I feel. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got to go back to the Bible to get the truth of what the matter is. And this, as I said earlier, this concept of, of heaven and hell has masked people's understanding of what truth is. So much so that even these fundamental doctrines about hell is starting to just drift away. It doesn't fit right with what we know now. The word hell, as it says, appears in the Bible, but its meaning and the context of when it's written, which is vitally important, we've got to see that it clearly relates to the grave. In fact, the word hell in the Hebrew actually means like a covering or a covered place. And so people got this concept of, of going down below the surface of the earth. In fact, another word that's pretty similar, the uh, same side, sort of idea is Gehenna. Uh, and Gehenna uh, means like hellfire or uh, a fire from a place covered over. And yet Gehenna is, is really a location outside of the walls of Jerusalem, a rubbish dump where the fire never stopped and kept burning. And so people like this idea that when a body was, 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 was dead or, or, um, or, or, or was beginning to corrupt, then the person would live on either in, in heaven if they were good or in hell if they, if they were wicked. And yet it's not a concept that the Bible even, even speaks about in those terms. Even Acts chapter 2 and verse 31, uh, David, the King David, was looking ahead to the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, uh, the, the, um, uh, the Apostle Peter said, he, David, seeing this before, spoke of the resurrection of Christ. In fact, it's Paul speaking. Um, David, seeing this before, spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up. And what we've been told there is that the Lord Jesus Christ, his, if, you, if you read it literally, his soul wasn't left burning in hell and God raised him up to, 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 to life again. But it doesn't fit because only the wicked go to hell. And yet we know from the scriptures that Christ was sinless. So why would a loving God send his son, sinless, down to burn and be punished for three or four days and then raise him up to heaven? Sounds like God's got it wrong. It's not talking about that at all. It's literally the grave. And the word there, and you can see other quotations which back that up and support that idea. It is simply the grave. He went down to the grave. He was resurrected in three days before his flesh actually started to corrupt. And God raised him up to life again. It is so interesting too, isn't it, that the world would very happily condemn a, a, a wicked ruler like, like a Hitler, like a, a Pol Pot or a Stalin or probably some modern day rulers as well, to this, this place of hell. Uh, we've got the concept of a special place in hell is reserved for you because of the wicked acts that you've, you've done. And yet there are so many people that have no interest in God, no interest in the Bible, and yet would stand there at a, a, a pastor, as I said earlier, at the funeral, when a person's lowered into the grave and they're sent to heaven. Surely, if they've got no interest in God, they'd go to this same place of torment. It's just, a not, it's just not a concept that we feel comfortable doing, sending our loved ones off to, uh, to hell, uh, when hell is a place reserved for anybody that doesn't appreciate and understand God. Surely, that would be the case. And yet it's not. It's just simply the grave. So what does happen to man at death? Well, at death, we cease from life. Quite simply, we cease from life. We lie unconscious in the grave. I can assure you, you've spent last night, hopefully all of you, asleep. And during this period of, a, of sleep, it's unconscious. There's no thoughts, maybe some dreams, but that's only thought about when you woke up. When you woke up. It's completely unconscious in the grave. Psalm 46 says, His breath goeth forth, he returneth to the earth. In that very day his thoughts perish. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 actually really sums it up beautifully. For the living know that they're going to die. We all, we all know that. We know our own mortality, don't we? 
But the dead, they don't know a single thing. They know not anything. And also their love, their hatred, their envy, that's gone. It's all perished. Whatsoever your hand findeth to do, he says, do it with all your might. Because in the grave, there's no work. There's no device. There's no knowledge. There's no wisdom. There's nothing in the grave. You lie unconscious in the ground. There's no afterlife where we waft up into heaven. It doesn't happen. The Bible is very clear that when we die, we lay in a box, as hard as that sounds, we're covered with earth, and we begin a process of corruption and decay back to dust from which we were formed. You can dig up an Egyptian mummy, has tried to be preserved as best as possible, embalmed, all the, all the ointments poured all over it, and we take off those embalming cloths and it's simply a decaying skeleton underneath, preserved as best we could. But in reality, just that process of decay has been slowed down, if you like. And if we were to dig up someone from a grave site that's been there for four or 500 years, probably some minor skeleton remains, but essentially going back to dust once again. I've been really negative, haven't I? I've been spending time talking about a really negative aspect of, of, of life and death. But the Bible's not like that. The Bible offers the most incredible hope. So even though we go to the same place, just as my dog and, and your cat, we go to the same place as them, in a grave, in the earth, decay, the Bible actually says that man, because he's different, he has a likeness of God. He can think like God. If we do, there's the most amazing hope, a hope of the resurrection from the dead at a future point in time. Eternal life actually has been described in three terms as a promise, as a hope, and as a reward for you and I. But a reward for righteousness, a reward for using your mental capacity to think like God and to act like God. John chapter one, oh sorry, first John chapter two, I should say, says, this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. The Apostle Paul in Titus, Paul writes himself, Paul in hope of eternal life, which God cannot lie, promised before the world began. So it's clearly there, isn't it, that there's a hope of eternal life. It's not talking about immortal, immortal soul, that we're with God. It talks about a hope to look forward to. Something to say, wow, we can, yeah, we, we can reach out to it almost and touch it. He says there in Romans chapter 2, God will render or God will reward to every man according to his deeds. To them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honour and immortality. He will give, he will render, he will reward with them is eternal life. What a wonderful thing to think about. Eternal life been offered as a promise to each one of us, been offered as something to look forward to and a reward for our righteous work. Everlasting life, therefore, is something to which we must attain. We must reach for it. And it's something that's promised, but it's actually not something that's possessed now. Our souls are not immortal. We don't go to heaven. It's something to reach out for. There are terms, though, that immortality is is granted on and the terms and conditions which you would expect for something so amazing so incredible are clearly outlined in the bible and they're not beyond our reach it's not something that we can look to and say i i, I can't do it is described though in bible terms as a gift from god an absolute gift that he offers each one of us he says there though in mark chapter 16 some terms and conditions Go you into all the world, he says, the Lord Jesus Christ says to his disciples, and preach the gospel to every creature. He says that he that believeth and is baptised shall be saved. Two critical points. He that believeth, understands it, uses his mental capability, this gospel message, gets it, understands it, and applies it, and then is baptised. It's those that will be saved. 
John backs that concept of baptism up by saying, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So born of water. So this concept of baptism. And Romans chapter 6 says, you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. So if you like, ladies and gentlemen, it's almost a, a three-step process. It's actually understanding the gospel that God's actually written in the Bible. And we're not going to spend tonight exploring that subject for another night. It's a, it's a quite a lengthy subject. But understanding that gospel that God has, has said and the conditions of which he's outlined for his reward. Following with baptism, being baptised. And also then actually a life of obedience. So an intelligent belief of the gospel followed by baptism. And a life then lived, dedicated to following the Lord Jesus Christ. This provides us with the opportunity for eternal life. It's interesting to note, though, that a Bible concept which, as, which is very, very clear and very clearly outlined for, for every one of us and part of our hope is the resurrection. And this is that hope that we're all looking forward to and which the prophets, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Apostle Paul all spoke about in length. Daniel, one of the Old Testament writers, wrote in Daniel chapter 12, many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. So he's talking about those that are unconscious, some of us, if the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't return, and many that have gone before, laying in the ground, decaying, going through a process of, of returning back to us, uh, uh, returning back to dust. He says, well, awake and come out. And John chapter 5, the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, Lord Jesus Christ's voice, and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of, of condemnation. So we're expecting a time, or hoping for, looking forward to this time of resurrection. We're looking forward to a time when Christ will call us out of the grave. Call us out. We know the conditions of that, but we know that, that resurrection precedes eternal life. Resurrection precedes this, this, uh, uh, this gift that God's going to give us. Who is raised? Is every single person that ever lived on the earth, is every animal raised up again? Well, sadly, that's not the case. There are conditions. There are uh, those that will be raised. The vast majority of people will not. And the Bible teaches that only the, the responsible, the responsible dead, both just and unjust will be, will be raised. And the words just and unjust imply that they had an understanding of God. They used at some point their mental capabilities to understand and appreciate God. It's whether they followed it or not is the, uh, is the criteria of whether they get eternal life. But if they've understood, they've believed, they've been baptised, they've understood what God wants, they will be raised. It's just determining whether or not you will be given immortality is the second point. And that's at the judgment seat of the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 2 says, those who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory, honour and immortality will receive eternal life. It's those that have actually taken that next step after baptism to continue on with the ways of God. Understanding what God wants and walking in it will receive eternal life. But Romans chapter 6 also paints a picture that's quite terrifying. Those who have rejected Christ's ways will experience tribulation and anguish, ending in death for a second time. And it paints a picture, doesn't it, of, of those that have got an opportunity for life, forevermore, eternal life, uh, and those that, that, that miss out on that, on that opportunity. So, ladies and, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it begs the question then, where will we spend eternity? Where is that going to be spent? Well, quite clearly, the Bible shows that our future is not in heaven in any way. Not at all. We will go right back to the book of Genesis in Genesis chapter 12. The great promises given to a, a faithful man called Abraham. And God said, look everywhere you can see Abraham, north, south, east and west. Everywhere you see, I'm going to give it to you and to your children. He didn't say, look up and look at the expanse of heaven, find a star, pick a spot and land there. Nothing like that of the sort. It's his promise for eternal life. Promise of a blessing is on earth. Supported by all these quotations, 
The very prayer that's read out in Parliament every day in South Australia includes these words. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And so the future prospect for every one of us in immortality with eternal life is actually to live and reign in a kingdom that's going to be established on earth. What about the quotation we read every, you know, every Christmas time, if you like? Glory to God in the highest. These are the words of, um, of, of the angels. Glory to God in the highest and upon earth, peace and goodwill towards men. God wants this earth fixed up. God wants this place to be a habitation for each one of us, for people that believe in him and follow him. And the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22, behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. The reward that we're going to receive will be on earth. It's going to be a kingdom that God's going to establish. He's going to provide everyone with the opportunity to rule with the Lord Jesus Christ upon the earth. And our reward, ladies and gentlemen, is on earth, not in heaven. When is this kingdom going to start? Well, Luke chapter 21 is one of those quotations we uh, Christadelphians love to go uh, to and, and, and to have a look at and to be reminded that we are really close to Christ's return. And if you're worried and you're anxious about what's going on in the world, we encourage you to return to your Bibles and read it carefully. What the, what the churches teach is nothing compared to the language of the Bible. It's so clearly written, isn't it? The hope that each one of us have is on earth. It's in the future. And each one of us has an opportunity to be there. We know what we need to do. We know the criteria. It's belief. It's baptism. It's following in, in well-doing. And as a community, we can show you exactly how, what that looks like and how to do that and how to get involved. But Luke 21, the Lord Jesus Christ reminded us about when he was going to return. And when he, was going, when he is going to judge the earth. And when he's going to raise people from the dead, and he reminds us in Luke 21 and verse 25 to 26 about times of distress of nations with perplexity, seeing the waves roaring. He says that men's hearts around the time of my return will fail them for fear and for looking after those things that are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And he reminds us that we're really close. The events of the world around his return will be times of worry and distress with men unable to, to, to find any way out. We're really close to that time, ladies and gentlemen, and we'd love to spend some time with you to talk about that and the wonderful signs that remind us that this kingdom is almost upon us and you have an opportunity to be there and involved in that. God talks about some times of refreshing that he's going to bring. And I can um, only concur with the words of our chairman at the start and also probably in your thoughts as well, that times of refreshing are long overdue. In Acts chapter 3 and verse 19 to 21, the Apostle Peter talked to the Jews and said to them, this is 2,000 years ago, repent you therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he will send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of the restitution of all things, the restoring of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Ladies and gentlemen, our appeal is to you is that you can be involved in that very process. We've talked tonight about the fact that there isn't an opportunity to, to go off and waft into heaven at death. It doesn't exist. We simply go down into the grave and begin a process of corruption, not with any knowledge, there's no envy, there's no love, there's, there's unconscious state in that grave. It's not a pleasant prospect. But what we're being reminded of is that even though we've got this concept of, of, of heaven and we've, and we've pushed that aside, the concept of hell, that's not there. We've been reminded though that the Bible does offer a hope, a wonderful hope, a promise, a hope and a reward. And what we're telling you, ladies and gentlemen, is you've got an opportunity to be there, to be involved in it. I just want to finish tonight with some words of one of the writers uh, who actually brought the Bible from, from Latin into English. His name is William Tyndale. Um, and you would expect this person to have read the Bible, if he's translated it, to get a good picture of what he's reading. 
and to get, on, get a good understanding. And remember, these words have been written a number of years ago, you know, two, three, four hundred, five hundred years ago. Have a think about that, how old these are. And yet the church today preaches words and concepts and ideas that are foreign. Have a listen to these words. And I want to conclude with this. He says, in putting departed souls in heaven, hell and purgatory, you destroy the arguments wherewith Christ and Paul prove the resurrection, which we have been warned to look for every hour. The heathen philosophers denying that did put that souls did ever live. And the Pope joined the spiritual doctrine of Christ and the fleshly doctrine of philosophers together. Things so contrary that they cannot agree. If the souls be in heaven, what cause is there for a resurrection? Gee, they're amazing words, aren't they? And here he is a writer who brought that Bible from, from Latin into English that you and I could read really clearly and simply. Said that papal doctrine, that, that doctrine of the church of going to heaven is not consistent with any message of Christ and the Apostle Paul who taught that each one of us can look forward to the resurrection hope. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to finish with those words because I think they summarise our lecture up tonight. You and I have the most wonderful hope of a resurrection and, and eternal life. It's not in heaven. It's not down in hell. It's here on earth. And we love to explore that more with you at some time and to show you that that's the promise that's been given to us by our wonderful, loving, heavenly Father.